Welcome to this webinar, which is titled Category Management. Uh, my name is Neil Wilkins, and thank you ever so much for coming along to this session, which for me is one of the key building blocks, no matter which sector you happen to be operating in or looking to explore. Often category management is intrinsically associated with the retail sector, uh, where categories of products are presented to us as consumers um, to encourage us to buy more. Um, however, and that is true, but however, uh, it is very, very applicable to pretty much every sector that you can imagine. And that's what I'm going to explore as we go through this particular session, because category management as a concept has a huge value, huge part to play for all of us. And the reason being, it is a very comprehensive approach to help us prioritize, to help us to target, to help us use big data to grow our businesses. OK, so the definition, if you like, of uh, category management, um, and this is a really nice uh, definition from Nielsen in their um, work um, called Fundamentals of Category Management, is they define it. They say category management is essentially a strategy that manages product categories as separate business units with an aim to produce better results by focusing on consumer value. So think about that. Category management, essentially a strategy that manages product categories as separate business units with an aim to produce better results by focusing on consumer value. Now, if you think about it, that really is at the heart of just good marketing management. But the fact that we're looking at these um, products, and you can obviously translate this across to services as well, um, in terms of them being things that will be creating um, their own little kind of business entities. In other words, you group together groups of products and you treat them similarly. You uh, focus them towards a particular target audience, maybe differently to other categories that you're managing. And it gives you a sense of control and it gives you a sense of customization of each category against the target audience that you're focusing on. So if you think about that, that doesn't just apply to retail, it applies to all of us, whether you are a product related business, or you could translate the word product into a service. And so there's something in this for everybody. And this is why I'm really excited by category management as a concept as a strategic process. And when I first learned about this, uh, many, many years ago, it has to be said, um, I've realized actually more recent times that this is a concept that has really served me well, both in working for businesses, um, in consulting, um, and certainly as I'm uh, helping people to learn the, the, the principles of marketing and marketing strategy, um, because it talks a lot about customer personas, it talks about the customer journey, it talks about product and service positioning appropriately and targeting and focus. And of course, because according to the Nielsen definition here, it focuses on value. So it is value to the to the, uh, the customer, but it's also value back to the business and very controllable value. And for me, these are some of the reasons, some of the many reasons why it really is fundamental to the way that I think about marketing. So I'm going to hopefully, by the end of this, encourage you to think in a similar kind of way around this particular topic. So where did cat management or cat man or category management, however you want to define it, where did it begin? So the birth of it, this really goes back to the 1980s um, in a report by the progressive grocer that they called the evolution of category management back in 2016. Um, they described it as a, conceived as a response to the shifting focus from brand centric strategies to an emphasis on categories of strategic business units. So it encompasses not just products, but a holistic approach to delivering value based on market trends, shopper behavior and data analysis. So even back then, back in the 1980s, and I first encountered this in the early to mid 1990s. So it was already a well-established marketing um, strategy or well-established um, set of marketing techniques. And when I encountered it, I could instantly, as a marketer, see the power that this held for me uh, in terms of controlling the narrative, of communicating clearly, of getting a real focus in everything that I did, responding to market trends, customer behavior, and of course, all of the inherent data 
um, and insights and metrics that I could draw from those activities. So it has evolved. Obviously, it's become super sophisticated now, right down to an individual shopper level. And obviously, if you include this in a an online transaction, for example, you can see specific targeting and a lot of you know very very clever focused. Um, marketing activities going on behind this but this is kind of really where it began so it's very well established it is quite old it's one of the more sort of archive approaches when you look back in the day but it has evolved I mean really now and again according to Marketing Week in a much more up-to-date um report they did uh, a particular um, article called why category management is a major key in marketing back in 2020 um they described it in in current form as being category management holds a pivotal role in marketing it's the linchpin that connects corporate strategy with in-store ex execution. You can translate that bit over to your industry. It helps marketers design a more effective mix of products and promotions by optimizing shelf space. And again, you could think of that in your own industry and aligning with shopper behavior and market trends. And this is the key bit here. The, the end goal is always to maximize customer value and stimulate business growth. So it really, at its core, category management has the concept of win-win. This is all about a deep, intimate understanding of your target customer, matching the value that you can bring and stimulating more of the same. So that's really the essence of this. If you are looking to grow your business, then you are in the right place listening to the right technique that's going to help you with a set of tools, a set of mindsets, a set of philosophies that will help you to drive your business forward very well established and really critical. So I'm going to stay for a while within the retail area, but we'll kind of dip out occasionally into other areas because this is important um, and is, of course, paramount um, of importance across various kind of retail and um, sectors that serve the retail industry. Um, and it aids in the understanding and catering to customer needs through strategic product assortment and placement if you like. So we're kind of seeing it there um, play out in, for example, the pharmaceutical industry, you know, crucial for effectively managing the supply chain of life-saving drugs, according to the Journal of Business and Industrial Marketing a couple of years ago. Um, but also it helps to balance the diversity of product offerings with inventory costs. So there's kind of a, a sort of a back office thing that is also supported by this. You know, I've talked so far really only about the front end. So what the customer sees in store, the categories, the way that products are placed and positioned on the shelf in alignment with others to support a, biz, a particular brand or business goal. But of course, in the back office, you can then also use how these products perform to drive your supply chain. So getting more cost efficient, getting more um, savvy about the inventory that you hold so that you're holding you know, just about the right amount of the right product to serve the customer in the right way at the right time. So this is all about efficiencies as well. And I have certainly been um, sort of well trained in the art of this um, through my time spent looking into category management through a particular brand, which I'll talk to you about in a minute, um, that had a big influence on a number of big retail channels because of this very process, this very process of looking at the efficiencies behind, because with efficiencies comes business growth, because you can reduce cost with efficiencies, which makes you more profitable. So not only can you sell more, which increases profitability, you can also reduce cost, which in, um, in hand in hand with the profitability also then increases your growth. And at the same time, and this was um, particularly of interest in this particular journal, that a lot of work that they did um, in their article, the importance of category management in different sectors, was they also talked about increased customer satisfaction. And of course, the concept of grouping your categories of products together so that you have a whole suite of products and services that answer to the same customer need means that it's very easy for the customer to understand the value that you're positioning in front of them. So it's easier for you to kind of interact with them. It's easier for them to understand the propositions. It's easier for them as well to cross-sell and upsell 
relevant products that support the core product they've come into your store to buy. So again, if you're looking at cross-selling and upselling, if you're looking at those concepts to see if you can get more value from the original purchase, so selling solutions, for example, rather than just individual products, then the concept of category management is right for you. So there's a lot of great stuff going on here. Um, so let's start looking into some of the benefits really of it. So, I mean, the first one really, which struck me was improved decision making. I mean, there's a lot and a lot of research around this and um, the benefit of improving your decision making. And the Harvard Business Review um, did a report called How Retailers Can Improve Decision Making with Category Management. That's snappily titled, does what it says on the tin back in 2018. And what they talked about was saying that Category management empowers retailers with data-driven insights, which lead to improved decision-making. Now, the reason for this is it helps them to understand the consumer's behavior, the market trends, and competitor strategies, enabling them to make informed decisions that align with their business objectives. So this is the real you know, benefit of using big data. So data that happens at the point of purchase. Now, of course, with um, EPOS, electronic point of uh, sales um, data. So knowing what you have purchased in your bas basket from a retail perspective, or of course, if you're doing online e-commerce, this translates across to you as well. Then you can start to make informed judgments. So why does this particular customer persona purchase this particular product with this one? One as well on a more frequent basis than anyone else? Or why does this particular um, customer persona on this day of the week purchase these three products in a statistically significant way? So we're seeing more of that bundle of products being purchased. And if we know that, what other products or services do we have that we could put into that category and start then to add and increase the value of the sales basket, but also the value to the customer because there's more relevance there. So the improvement of decision making rather than just, oh, we've got a load of products, let's put them on the shelf and see what sells. This is becoming forensically and scientifically very, very smart. And I just love that. I really think in terms of return on investment, that phrase that we always use in marketing, this is really where it's starting to score. So it's exciting. Another benefit is efficient resource allocation. So if we can really understand the intricacies of each category, I'm struggling to say that word there, um, the intricacies of each category, we can then start to allocate our resources more efficiently because we can identify high performing categories, allocate resources appropriately to maximize the returns by them, and then identify areas of improvement in other categories. This is from the Journal of Retailing and Consumer Services back in 2019. Now, of course, we can play this across into every industry. If we know, and of course we do know through Pareto principle that 20% of our product categories are gonna give us 80% of our returns. But just going blindly into just selling product and whatever the customer wants, we'll just sell that and then we'll move on to the next customer or worse still, we'll just try and find new customers and forget about the existing ones. Category management is a really great discipline for saying, OK, we understand which categories are working and we can see our top 20 percent. Let's put 80 percent of our resources, our people, our budget, our time behind that 20 percent, because by default, that's going to give us at least 80 percent of the return. So we can get really, really precise here, really targeted and really, really efficient with the allocation of our resources. And just by doing that the return on investment of our efforts as marketers will go through the roof. And I've seen this happen time and time again. This stuff works. And I'll give you a really nice example, and just a little bit of a story at the end of this from where I've seen this work the best. And in fact, actually, it was the very first encounter that I had with category management. It really does provide benefits, not only to the business, but also to the customer. 
So in the Journal of Business Research in 2020, they looked at the impact of category management on customer satisfaction. And what they led to the conclusion was that a well-implemented category management strategy doing the things we're talking about ensures that customer needs are at the heart of all decision-making processes. You know, not just playing lip service to, oh, we serve the customer, but proving it, really having data-driven evidence that says, yep, we know where we're focusing our efforts. We're developing the right products and services to serve that need. And we're developing them from a category management perspective. In other words, we're grouping products and services in, selling them either as categories categories and or as solutions to meet customer needs because we're listening to what and we're man monitoring and measuring what the customer is buying not just what they say they want but actually what they do so it's monitoring behavior as much as it is monitoring forecasts and trends for example and ultimately of course because this just looks and feels right to the target audience it ultimately will lead over a period of time to enhanced customer satisfaction, which in turn comes back to the ROI piece, leads to customer lifetime value increases because a satisfied customer has no reason to go anywhere else. So they will stay with you longer. And so the chances of repeat purchase, the chances of another inquiry and the chances of advocacy where they share the great stuff you're doing is going to be increased. So there's a win-win, win-win-win thing going on here. And again, this is really why I'm so excited by this stuff. So it genuine, genuinely, it will boost revenues and your market share. Uh, McKinsey have done a lot of work in category management. Um, and one report that they did a couple of years ago, which was all about can it drive revenue growth? Well, their conclusion was that it categorically can. So can Category management is a powerful tool for revenue growth. By focusing on delivering value to the customer, retailers can drive customer loyalty, just what I was saying, leading to increased repeat purchases and ultimately a boost in revenue and market share. So it's not just me saying the theory will work and you should give it a try. You know, McKinsey and others have come up with a lot of evidence, a lot of case studies and examples which back up this philosophy. It really does work. It works because you're increasing revenue through being more relevant. And it also increases the profitability because you're also at the same time becoming more efficient. And that in turn reduces cost. So revenue growth, but also profit margins will be enhanced by taking this approach. OK, so one of the words I've mentioned quite a few times so far is this word prioritization. OK, so what we've got to be careful here is how we then prioritize, because prioritization in category management is crucial for several reasons. The first one being efficient resource utilization. Now, not all categories, you cannot apply this to every product, every category of products that you have. They don't all have the same potential for profitability or growth. So what you need to do is prioritize the categories based on factors like growth potential, the competitive intensity, for example, and also the strategic importance to your business and where your business is looking to go and uh, looking to go and looking to grow. So you don't do category management as a product centric activity in isolation. You need to be doing it in line with your higher level marketing goals, but also your high level strategic business goals. Because then you'll help the efficient allocation of resources such as time, um, people and the investment of budget to categories that promise the highest returns. OK, so all the time we're looking to get deep into the data to figure out where are the product categories that have the most potential. And are these the ones that uh, we're going to focus on? And then you can have those proper discussions within the organization based on the evidence, based on the big data to make those decisions. Again, we're looking for that top 20 percent because 80 percent of your profitability, 80 percent of your um, returns and value will come from that 20 percent. Also, then we need to be focusing in on our strategies. So prioritization enables you to develop tailored strategies for each category. 
Now, this is where it comes down into it being individual business units, and it truly can be. So rather than thinking, here's all of our products, let's go and prioritize them and sell them. This is truly about grouping products together that serve maybe a similar or a complementary need in the customer's eyes and saying, okay, if this is solving a particular problem, what other things have we got that we could prioritize and create these bundles? Okay, so categories are like bundles of things that you can offer, which add incredible value to your customer. And so the high priority categories might require you to be a little bit more innovative. It might require you to do something that's competitively advantageous. So you might need to look at your pricing, for example. And lower priority categories might just need cost efficiency strategies. In other words, you might just need to be able to do those in a more efficient way. But you're not necessarily going to be investing all of your marketing budget, your marketing and promotional focus on those lower priority categories. You're still going to focus on them, still going to do them because you've still got customers there who may well benefit. But prioritization allows you to then be devoting appropriate amounts of attention and budget and time and marketing, if you like, on the places that really matter. And that's really, really key as you go forward in this. Also, it will involve your suppliers. Now, depending on, I'm just going to talk here in terms of a, a retail supply chain here, just as an example, but think about the suppliers into your organization. Because if you've prioritized your categories, it helps you then manage the supplier relationships that you have, no matter what widgets or what um, partners you have in your organization to help you to create value that you can then sell as a product or service. The high priority categories may require you to think about the strength of the relationships you have with suppliers. Maybe go seek new suppliers to serve certain categories. And then maybe the lower priority categories can just be more transactional relationships where you just have a contract and they're just serving on a, a more of a conveyor belt approach. So your strategic relationships then can focus on where it really matters. So again, this is a great use of time. This is a great use of, you know, almost bundling a series of people in your organization against each individual category. So you have, you know, crack teams of professionals who will look after the core categories in your business and in your product portfolios. And of course, by prioritizing categories based on the customer's needs and the preferences, your business will be better able to meet those expectations and also then increasing and improving customer satisfaction and loyalty because you're able to be more responsive. So as you listen to how the categories play out in the real world, you can then make adjustments. So if certain services or products need to be swapped out for other things in the category because you're monitoring it, because you're listening to it actively and because then you're proactively responding to how then that category performs it means then you're always working with fresh stuff so products within your highest priority categories never go out of there and they never go out of date they're never kind of obsolete because they're contributing to a greater thing they're great they're contributing to something that is you know, positioned at the next level up. So people, your customers, your suppliers, your staff are buying into a higher level of category in which your products and services provide support. So as something becomes less relevant because maybe a competitor is doing it better, don't start crying, swap it out for something that is more effective to deliver the value in that category. So if you think about this from how you offer products individually now, this is something that can allow you to really think more conceptually about the solution cell. And that is ultimately at the heart of the strategy behind category management and prioritization. So it allows you to reduce risk. It allows you to you know, not be exposed to dying products in your matrix and in your mix that are just kind of, they're a little bit long in the tooth. We still make a few sales, but they're a little bit outdated. Those now will become very quickly obsolete as you focus your efforts and attentions on the solutions stroke, the categories that are really selling. So it allows you then to reduce the risk that, you know, you're wasting time and energy and budget on stuff that really doesn't matter. 
And of course, then ultimately, it allows you to improve your performance and profitability by focusing really everything in your business. That's marketing, sales, and beyond. So production, um, customer service, um, you know, delivery, if you have delivery um, chain, everything can then be focused on where the most value is being recognized. And you'll have the data to prove it. And this is the key thing. The key element within this mix is everything we're talking about here is data driven. You can't do category management by making it up. So there's no anecdotal evidence here. You'll have the data because you've done the research in advance to create these categories or these bundles of products and services. So I've talked a little bit about the 80-20 um, rule. The 80-20 the, um, rule is the Pareto principle uh, from our friend and economist back in the 19th century, uh, the Italian economist Pareto. Um, it's basically an economic rule that just works and it 100% works for you uh, in category management. And it basically says, if you're not familiar with it, it says that 80% of the outcomes or outputs will result from 20% from of the causes or inputs for any given event. So 80% of your sales will come from 20% of your clients or customers and 80% of your profits come from 20% of your products. Now, when you go and do the research to be able to prioritize, to be able to agree collectively which categories and which solutions and bundles you are going to focus your marketing on for the rest of this year and into next year, then you can find very, very quickly and easily that this 80-20 rule does work. I will guarantee you, I've never seen an example where it doesn't. So I will guarantee that when you break this down, you look at the lead table of your customers, 80-20 will work. You look at the lead table of your products, or even if you are doing category management right now, you do the same. And it will be and will follow the 80-20 rule. And this is so powerful because once you do this analysis, you can't ever not know the 80-20 rule because you will see the value instantly because it will be there. Don't ask me how, don't ask me why, it is just there. So the trick as a marketer is to know you're always focusing on the 20% because the 80% of noise, which is what it will be, the 80% of distractions, which inevitably that is, will take care of itself or become the more transactional sales that we talked about before. So your focus as a category manager and or as a marketer is to identify that 20% because then your business is getting value from you and your team and the rest of the organization. Now, there's a next level, if you like, which is called ABC analysis, which allows you to get it a little bit more forensic again. Um, it is kind of a Pareto analysis, um, but here, A roughly represents the top 20%. OK, which accounts for 70 to 80 percent of the consumption value. B then is the next 30 percent that account for around about 15 to 25 percent of the value. And C is the remaining 50 percent of the items accounting for around five percent of the value. So if you already are doing category management, if you already bundle your products and services, have a little play with ABC analysis because it will help you to see really which ones are you know distracting you which ones the sales force are saying oh no can we have a, a data sheet or can we have a brochure or can we have a marketing campaign on this particular product or this particular category and then you look at the data and you think oh that's in the c band mm, okay it might be appropriate for you salesperson but actually strategically we're focusing on the a band because we know that's where the value is. So this allows you to basically be making evidence-based prioritizing decisions and then share really openly and honestly with the rest of the organization how these decisions are coming about. You know, ABC analysis is just great for the kind of planning meetings that we're talking about here because it allows you then to collectively all see that this is not just being done as a, on a whim. This is not just being done because you like the look and feel of that particular product. It's being done based on science. And so for me, as a strategic marketer, that's powerful. And that also is talking the language of the business. Because often without things like these sorts of tools or these sorts of approaches, marketing can be seen as just making more woolly decisions. 
So this brings the science and the business diligence into the way that we can convey our recommendations. We convey what we are suggesting strategically is important for the business. So it's really, really important. You can use ABC analysis as well um, as an inventory categorization technique. Um, and, and often, really, this kind of um, can be used for always better control. OK, where you divide your inventory, so the range of products and or categories that you have into A items, B items and C items, like your A list and your B list and your C list when it comes to actors or friends. I don't know if you're like me, but you might have an A list and a B list um, just because you've got a very busy diary, for example. So your A items here would be high value products with a low frequency of sales, typically subject to tight control and very accurate records. So they're really you know, they're your big hitters. The B items could be moderate value and moderate frequency. So they require reasonably tight control, probably pretty good records. And then you see items, the lower value, but there's a high frequency of sales. And these require simpler controls, minimal records. And probably this is kind of just your transactional stuff. So this is another way of categorizing your categories and or your product portfolio or your service portfolio. So group to um, different ways that your business defines as strategically important. Now, I can't sit here and tell you which is the best option or which is the one that's going to produce the best answers. The trick really is to go away and experiment. One or two of these ideas might really ring true. And you think, oh, that sounds like us. Culturally, there's a fit. Strategically, there feels like a fit. Um, and for some of the others, you might also then think, hmm, OK, well, that's interesting. We might play with that, but we might hold that one for a rainy day. So there is no one size fits all in this approach. OK, but the key thing that we're looking to do here is the word targeting. So once you've got, once you understand how you're going to create these bundles or these categories, targeting is the next step. And it's the process of identifying and understanding the specific segments of customers that are going to respond best within your category. So you will instantly, as you start to do this exercise, begin to identify types of customers or personas, as I like to call them, who just kind of resonate more with this particular category. And as I say, I'll give you a really nice example at the end where this one just came home to me totally and I just understood it. And then it's it's created, you know, a mindset for me that I've never lost. And it's how I do customer persona building, customer journeys and product placement within those journeys ever since. And I've been doing this now in this particular way for some sort of 25 years. So this kind of stuff really does, it gets you, it gets you in your head, gets you in your heart. And targeting in this kind of way allows the whole idea of a personalized approach to your categories, because you can then start to really kind of customize it. So it's more and more meaningful because it doesn't matter that a different persona sees a different category and doesn't see the one you're focusing on right now, because this one's designed for this lot and this one's designed for that lot. So it will help to drive the satisfaction and loyalty that I mentioned before. It will lead to improved product assortment and placement. And of course, the key thing when it comes to targeting is it will optimize. That's the key word here. Optimize your pr promotional activity activities, because you'll have a very clear view of the calls to action when you do your campaigns, of the kinds of products and services that this customer needs, and that therefore underlying your particular campaigns you're actually using underneath to underpin them. Everything becomes clear, super, super clear as you go forward using these kinds of approaches. Now, of course, within segmentation, which is part of this kind of building of the, the detail, if you like, it will allow you to identify and understand distinct customer segments and the personas within them based on the buying behavior, the, pre the preferences that they have, and to solve their needs. So you can then develop a targeting strategy. So you can develop a particular strategy or strategies for each of these segments. And I would always say that when beginning the kind of category management journey, that it's always worth beginning with one segment, one product category or one service category 
agree and then one approach because if you can create a system process um, or a template if you like or a framework that allows you to go step by step through this measure it evaluate it and then increasingly continuously improve it then what you've done is you've created created a legacy for every other category that you will ever want to create. So do it with one segment to start with. Now, you might be sat there thinking, well, I can't pref can't um, prioritize that. I mean, I, I can't do preferred customer segment because we've got so many within our business. And I will say, yes, I share the pain. But the question is, do you have the resources to do this more than once and learn with every single one? And I will challenge that you don't because you're already working to a full diary. You're already talking to other people and colleagues who are already stretched within your business. Nobody has spare time in this current world. So if you focus on one, that will give you the opportunity to really help this to embed as a process, and then you can re release it out to others. So learn it with one. And I wouldn't necessarily say either. It needs to be the one that's very much at the top of your A-list. This could be an organization or a segment or a product category that's maybe in the B list. So it's kind of important, but it's not business critical uh, because then you can kind of do stuff, but almost a little bit behind the scenes. It might be um, a friendly and very responsive and very loyal segment, but it might be just a little bit safer because the sheer volume of sales uh, that you're reliant on do not come from this segment, which allows you then to maybe practice and test and be maybe a little bit more innovative than you otherwise would be. So you know, start to you know increase the number of uh, a range of um, ideas that you have for this and play with pricing strategies. Use different promotional activities. You know, begin to target them at this category level. And of course, as we've said said all along and all the way through this, use data to continuously track. So those KPIs, those key performance indicators really come into play here so that you can adjust you know, what you see and how you respond to it. You can adjust it almost instantly. So if a product needs to come out because it doesn't seem to be contributing and people aren't getting it as part of this category, this group or bundle in this solution that you're offering them, Take it out, instantly take it out and then see what happens. Don't just take it out and say, right, that's job done. Evaluate what then happens next, because this really is refining and this really is optimizing and this is continuous improvement. So it's exciting, but it requires a commitment. It really, really does. And for business growth, which ultimately we're aiming for here is you start to roll out the concept of category management across you know, various different categories to serve you know, various different parts of the business, to deliver personalized customer experiences, to drive satisfaction and loyalty. You will be leading yourself as an organization to expanding market opportunities. You know, you can develop new categories. You can look at categories that serve maybe a new geography or maybe a new market sector that you want to break into. And this in itself probably will require you to forge new strategic partnerships and collaborations as you grow those categories to serve new markets. So can you see what's happening here? This is something that, you know, just by its nature starts to proliferate across the whole organization. This is not a marketing activity that can be done in isolation. In fact, quite the opposite. This is really at the heart of collaboration and really effective cross multidiscipline working in your organization, which, of course, can be led by marketing. So there's a Another spin-off benefit here that it positions marketing at the heart of strategic decision making. So rather than just, hey, we do social, we do a bit of lead generation and yeah, we've got a bit of a handle on our branding. This really touches on every part of your business. So there's some really exciting stuff that goes on here. And because it's all data driven, it helps you as you go forward using the big data that's going to now come from all parts of the business by doing it in this way. Everything from, you know, EPOS data, electronic point of sale through, you know, helpful, you know, in, you know, sort of things like um, demand forecasting. So you can plan your stock, plan your inventory, know what you need, but not overstock. So you can actually reduce, you know, um, sort of inventory down 
down if you're actually too, holding too much stock of a particular product, for example. You know, this kind of demand forecasting when you're getting so close to the customer and then watching their every move, their behaviors, it allows you to be, you know, really slick, really fleet of foot in the decision making on a tactical level as, and an operational level as well as a strategic level. Another thing you can use you know, the big data for is enhancing the customer insights, because that's what you're working with. You know, you can get down and forensic. Um, often we hear these called you know, granular insights. I like to use the word forensic because it implies that you're like doing detective work because, you know, the, the metrics and the data is only so valuable. But the evaluation that you can draw from it, that's the key. So you can better understand from this, you know, customer needs and preferences, the timing, when and how to deliver, how to position so that you can effectively manage the categories. And over time, this is the thing. So a lot of this data is going to provide you with trend information. So you'll know that things suddenly become seasonal. Hey, we haven't looked at it like this before. Suddenly we've realized summer is a great time for this category. Who would have thought it? Because, of course, by looking at things on an individual product or service level, you often miss those little nuances that when you bundle stuff together, you see bigger, higher level strategic patterns. So that can be really interesting. And correlated with that, you can then optimize your pricing and promotion strategies because with things like electronic point of sale data and big, and big data across any other type of organization, you can monitor how price changes and promotional activities within the categories will affect sales in theory in real time. So if you are doing any kind of digital transactions, e-commerce sites or anything within you know, a high street environment, for example, you can change this in real time. So these kinds of insights allow you to really optimize your pricing. You don't just set a price for a product and then maybe occasionally give a bit of a discount. You can have very flexible pricing strategies, which again, allow you to drive sales growth and or profitability. So whatever you need at a point in time or in a particular month or quarter or strategically across the period of a, of a whole year, you are able to do using this kind of approach. Big data driven category management, bundling of product and service, targeting those products and services or categories against a key market or customer segment and doing targeted promotions to those segments, you can now see how that data analysis will help you to drive your business forward. And almost to the point, in most businesses, the potential is there for real-time performance tracking. So you can make quick adjustments. You can be super competitive by doing it this way, because then you can make, you know, adjustive activities, you can change the tactics, you can change your campaigns, you can switch things on, switch things off. And so this will ensure the effectiveness of your category management strategies are always being done based on the data, based on the trends and based on real time, real world behaviors of your customers. And that's key. So you don't have to wait for the annual market research report to come in before you make a judgment, because, of course, that's probably 12, 18 months out of date. You can be working from real time data on a dashboard that tells you and helps you to see everything at a touch of a button, literally. And all of this in terms of theory, I mean, I've obviously needed to use to kind of set the scene here. All of this in theory can go and can play out in many other sectors beyond the, the retail sector. So you'll see improved procurement efficiency. You know, category management can be a really powerful tool, for example, in for manufacturing, helping you to streamline your procurement process. So you can categorize similar items using production. So that as a manufacturer, you can better negotiate with suppliers, standardize products where possible, and of course, then improve or reduce your costs. And every manufacturer would like to do that. But that's still following category management procedures. If you're in hospitality, for example, hotels, restaurants, that kind of thing, um, in that sector, you can use it to enhance the range and quality of services that you offer. 
So if you really understand different customer needs or categories that you're serving, you know, you can tailor the service offering, often leading to improved guest satisfaction and loyalty. So category management in the hospitality industry, following this real time data analysis and bundling of products and services to cross sell and upsell the other value that you can bring to your customer. Why would they want to go or stay or eat anywhere else? Huge opportunities to really kind of embrace this philosophy within the marketing and communications activities that you do. And if you're in, um, say, pharmaceuticals, for example, you know, you can apply these kinds of theories to manage the portfolio of drugs and therapies that you have by prioritizing areas of research and development. For example, you know, you can manage the relationships with healthcare providers as well as resellers and retailers and align the offerings to patients needs. So you're all kind of working from one core strategy and think there with the third parties of the kind of depth of relationship you're going to be bringing in because they're working from your data they're working and almost relying on their value-added activities on your particular strategies so they you know they become really inherent in the, the business um, that you're offering and the business that you're doing so really exciting uh, business development in its broader sense opportunities here for that industry and for logistics and supply chain companies you know managing and optimizing inventory levels clearly is absolutely key so categorizing items based on factors like demand variability lead times and carrying cost Businesses, you know, all over the planet can improve inventory turns and reduce stockouts and overstock situations. So you can just become smarter, leaner, more fleet of foot and just more appropriate to the needs of the markets that you're serving. So. Where do you find examples of this stuff in practice? I've said I'm going to tell you a little bit of an example, and I will in just a moment. But the, the key one um, that you'll often see, if you search category ex uh, management examples in practice, um, you'll, you'll see there's a big one. The, the big Procter & Gamble partnership with Walmart has often been hailed as you know the quintessential example of uh, Catman strategies in practice. Um, and it just shows pretty much everything that you're going to need to know. Um, um, you can just do a, a, a little search on that one. You'll find it in the uh, Harvard uh, Business School's uh, journals. Um, it's been constantly revised. It's a very well established one, but it's been constantly revised over the years. But I'm not going to go down that kind of route because uh, you can read all about that yourself. I just want to tell you a little story for my time when I worked for uh, BB Castrol uh, back in the 90s. And um, we were selling engine oil. I was the uh, European marketing manager for the Castrol GTX brand, uh, running sort of big TV campaigns and doing promotions uh, all over Europe uh, for, for my particular brands. Um, exciting products, exciting times, big budgets, all really good. But we were selling oil until we decided to focus on category management. And this changed everything. So rather than our retailers, the likes of B&Q, Halfords, Tesco's, uh, petrol forecourts, rather than these um, buyers buying our oil products, which were well positioned, you know, great long heritage, decades of heritage, so very reliable, you know, good pricing, they could make good margins from them. But we changed the industry by taking the category management approach. Now, what we did is we talked about the car care category. So we instead of talking about we're going to sell you oil, we are going to help you care for your car. Um, the strap line that we had for this particular product category was it was protection from the moment you turn the key. Well, now it's protection because we don't turn the key. We press the button now in our cars. But back then is you turn the key to start your car. So it was protection from the moment you turn your key. Now it's protection from the minute you start. And the products, which were um, technologically very, very clever, would actually protect the uh, the runnings and the you know the parts of the motor that, that were the, the most friction um, sort of bearing um, at that moment when the engine is cold. So it really needed oil. And what our positioning was that yes, we've got a product to support you, 
but actually we know the category. So what we did is we talked to and did a huge amount of research, um, a big budget, I can tell you this was big budget research, into establishing who the personas are who care for their cars. And we established two key personas at both ends of the spectrum. There were many, we had about eight different personas who we could serve with car care some of whom were very interested. So we had Kevin, who was the car, the classic car enthusiast. And Kevin would every Sunday morning be um, out there polishing his car, tinkering with the engine, fettling with the you know, various nuts and bolts and things. And he would love the product, but he wanted to be part of this car care category of which the retailers then could bundle in other products. So not only Castro GTX products, but other products that would help him to care for his car. And we had done the research to help the retailer, so the BQ, BQs, Halfords and Tesco's of this world, to understand the other products that would be rel you know, relative to the oil that would be able to be put on the shelf as a category or bundle. So we knew for Kevin, because we'd done the big ticket research, the other products that he would value. So instantly, the opportunity when he comes into store to buy the Castro GTX Magnatech product, he would then see positioned on the shelf other products that we had researched, not Castro products, but you know, other retailing um, products that would be relevant to him. So the basket value as he picked those up along with his oil increased. So you can see the kind of philosophy here that we were working to. And of course, the retailers loved it because we were helping them to manage a new category here. So not just sell oil, but sell a bundle, which had a much higher basket value and profitability for them. So it was a win, win, win. Kevin was happy. The retailers were happy and we were very happy because we were selling more oil and developing the relationship with our resellers, our retailers. On the other end of the spectrum was Sally. Um, Sally is a Mini Cooper driving, or back in these days was a Mini Cooper driving um, person who had no interest at all, did not want to open the bonnet um, of her car. And basically, when she was in filling up with fuel, uh, filling the Mini Cooper up with fuel, she would be seeing the engine oil light come on. And so it was an impulse purchase. And so the category there was that we were positioning um, the product um, in the store in petrol forecourts. So it was positioned very, very easily so that as she was paying for her um, the uh, the fuel and uh, that fuel bill, she would very easily be able to pick up that um, sort of smaller pack of um, the Castro GTX product to then just top up the um, engine oil uh, when she went back out to her car. And that was the only interest that she actually had. And we had a significant audience here of these particular persona who were, you know, very, very happy to be handheld through it. And um, I would probably myself fall into the Sally. I would be a Sally in that regard, because I have no interest in what goes on under the bonnet. Uh, but we created this persona and then we could market to them in the right place at the right time, etc, etc, etc. So I hope you can see with that very, very simple example that um, Really, for me, it really um, sort of, you know, set in my mind for the rest of my marketing career right up to today, just how I can use the concept of customer personas, the bundling of relevant other products around my core product to create a category, focusing that category in the right place at the right time in the customer's journey to solve their need, a very, very different need for each individual customer persona that we were targeting. So I'd like you to think really as fast as you can about, you know, straight after this session and listening and, and uh, watching this, think about some of your key uh, target personas. What kinds of things are they buying right now and what kind of other products could you bundle in as category solutions and then start to explore well, what is this category that I'm creating here? Start at that very, very base level. That is what we did back in the day with this big, big ticket project. Um, and it involved people right across the business and it became an international project. So it was you know, born from very, very small seeds, but grew into something that really changed the business and competitively was just knocking other competitors off the shelf literally, because we were owning something that was bigger than ourselves for the value to the customer, the value to the reseller and the value to us.
So to round up, category management really can hold a pivotal role in your marketing. Um, this Marketing Week quote is lovely. It's the linchpin that connects corporate strategy with in-store execution, helps marketers design a more effective mix of products and promotions by optimizing shelf space, however you define it, of course, um, and aligning with shopper behavior and market trends. The end goal is always to maximize customer value and to stimulate business growth. So I'd recommend you really take that, uh, that concept on board, have a little play with it, see what resonates, think about your target personas, think about the kind of product portfolio you have at the moment, and do some deep dives into the data and see if you can find uh, patterns, see if you can find trends, see if you can find bundles of opportunity of drawing together products and services that would add you know, a greater um, value than their individual parts. So as individual products and services, yeah, they're great. They've got you to where you are today. But I would say if you can start to make a, um, a beginning to the category management journey on behalf of your organization, you will find some incredibly innovative, some incredibly powerful ideas and opportunities will come to fruition. So I wish you every success with this uh, little journey. Uh, if you need any further assistance in this one, it is something that I've kind of been living and breathing for a long, long time. So connect with me if we're not already connected. Uh, connect with me at Neil Wilkins X. And I look forward to uh, hearing your success stories. It would be lovely to have another case study example that I can share that you're really proud of and you'd love to share with me and for me to advocate it and share it with uh, all of my networks. So we're going to be doing more topics like this in the coming months. Head over to uh, marketingcollege.com slash events for a, a number of other topics that are very, very similar to this one. I hope you found this one really, really helpful. It is something I think you probably can tell is uh, very close to my heart because I've seen it uh, play out successfully so many times in so many industries. So have a little play yourself. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the process. You don't have to get it right first time. You can do it really small to start with but just make a start because i will almost guarantee you you're going to have some fun and you're going to make a difference at every step that you take